Good morning and a warm welcome to you on this lovely sunny Sunday morning. A special welcome if you're new and perhaps visiting us for the first time. It's great to have you with us and a special welcome for those joining us online. Last Sunday we celebrated with joy the first Easter Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus three days after his death by crucifixion on a cross. And this morning, David Jackman will be sharing the implication and the spiritual reality of this truth for us through the Apostles, Apostle Paul's teaching in his letter to the Romans. Because Jesus rose, we can rise too in new life. It's an incredible love gift from God our Father. By faith, we just need to reach out and take hold and live this new life in Jesus. So can I invite you to stand? And let's reach out and in some opening words declare our thanks and praise to God. Blessed be God by whose grace creation is renewed by whose love heaven is open, by whose mercy we offer our sacrifice of praise. Blessed be God forever. So let's rejoice and offer up our praise as we sing our first song. Let the verses speak to us afresh of his great love as we sing praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one.
We've just sung some amazing words. We were without hope, yet Jesus came to reconcile us and redeem us, bought by his sacrificial blood. He's the God who runs to bless us, who restores and frees us and raises us up in his steadfast love. So let's respond, let's sit or kneel and still our hearts as we prepare for our time of confession. Our God is faithful, wanting and waiting to forgive and cleanse us and bless us when we come to him. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sins and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Let's just take a moment as we prepare to turn away from our sins and turn to Jesus. Let's say the confession together. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess in my whole heart my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts I have done to others, and the good I have left them. God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you, and raise me up to newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, would you like to sit as uh, James comes to share with us some church family news? Thanks, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Just a few things uh, from me this morning for church family news. If you are a woman and wants to, want to go to the Sussex Gospel Partnership uh, Women's Convention on the 8th of June, uh, that is... Uh, going to guarantee to be sold out so people are booking up already um, if you want a lift please email the office book your ticket online and um, put your name down for either the bus or other transportation going to Crowborough for the 8th of June the women's uh, convention also on Wednesday evenings uh, on starting on uh, the 17th of April we have the life of Jesus course looking at Luke's gospel and looking at um, first century um, archaeological evidence and um, historical evidence uh, for Jesus's life, death and resurrection. It's a great course to get into Luke's gospel but also a course to invite people who are asking questions. So please do take one of the flyers and invite friends or family and join us uh, when you can. Even if you can only make a few of the Wednesday evenings, each Wednesday evening would be a blessing to you and to us. So do come along to the Life of Jesus course. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we are starting um, a series in the book of Exodus. Uh, so this, uh, after the service today, we have an Exodus devotional uh, booklet that you can buy for two pounds. That will be on sale over in the church hall. And it will be just a helpful way, like we do uh, with many of our sermon series or Easter or uh, Christmas times, just to have a little uh, Bible thought first thing or last thing in your day. Um, and it will help you get to grips uh, with the whole book of Exodus, but also in bite-sized chunks, uh, feed you spiritually uh, each day. So do pick that up for two pounds um, after the service. I need to read some bands of marriage from some dear church family members. So I'm going to publish the bands of marriage between Edgar's Kalnans and uh, Georgia Taylor, 
both of this parish. This is for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you should declare it. Great, that's one out of three times of asking. Let's pray for Ed and Georgia. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage. And we do pray that as Ed and Georgia prepare for their wedding day, that they would have their eyes fixed on you. They would have a marriage that has Christ at the center. Would you bless them and bless us through them? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Well, I think uh, Steffi and Romley have our all-age slot this morning. As always, if the young or young at heart would like to join us at the front, please do. I know we're not quite as exciting as Julian, Julian and Annalie, but yeah, do, do come and join us. <laughs> you had a good Easter, people? Ooh, I love The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. It's my first time reading it, but this Aslan guy is great. He's totally going to kapow the White Witch. It's going to be Awesome. It certainly will be. But, but he's starting to get a bit creepy, though. The White Witch is saying he's going to kill Aslan. But it'll be okay. Aslan's the king, so he'll just roar and get rid of the witch. Right? Um, not quite right, Romilly. No. Have any of you read it? He dies? I thought he was going to save the day. But instead, he died? Yeah, well, Aslan had to die. Why would he have to die? And how can he defeat the White Witch now? Now she'll kill everyone, and there will always be winter and never be Christmas. Funnily enough, this is really similar to this week's Sunday School story. Really? Did some mighty saviour die in the Bible too? Uh, Romilly, didn't you listen to anything last week? You know... Good Friday when Jesus died, and Easter Sunday when he rose from the dead. Oh yeah, <laughs> silly me. But Jesus rose again, and Aslan is dead forever and ever and ever. Well, do you know what? First of all, when Jesus rose from the dead, all of his friends thought that he was gone forever and ever as well, and they were really sad, including Cleopas and his wife Mary. They were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they were really sad because their friend had died. Like how Susan and Lucy were really sad because Aslan had died. Yes, but while they were walking, Jesus appeared and started talking to them. And then they were mega happy because their friend was there. Oh, uh, no, they didn't actually recognize him. They didn't recognize him. He'd only been dead for three days. Yeah, but they still didn't recognize him. So Jesus told them and he showed them that all through the Bible, um, it was been said that he was going to die and it was all part of God's plan. Awesome. Have you read The Magician's Nephew? Uh, the Who's What Now? Oh, that's the book that comes before The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And in The Magician's Nephew, it tells us that there's a great evil in Narnia, but Aslan says he's going to come and he's going to defeat it and suffer. Why don't you carry on reading that book? Aslan's alive! I'm so happy I could sing! And Jesus is alive! And we're so happy we can sing, so shall we stand up and sing all through history? As always, the actions are for the brave and joyful. Take 
Let's pray for the children before they go out to their Sunday school groups. Father, we thank you for our children and for us being able to sing together and talk about you and your faithfulness. We pray that as they go to their groups, you will speak and share your heart with them so that they would know your love and grow and follow you. Please bless them and their teachers and helpers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Off you go then. Have a great time. And why don't you say hello to your nearest neighbour as they go out. We'll do carry on those conversations at the end of the service, perhaps over coffee or tea in the hall. But now before David speaks and shares with us on resurrection life, James will bring us our reading from Romans chapter 6. Now, Romans chapter 6, that's found on page 1132, and there are Bibles in the pews, and they're the same page number as the one up here. That's page 1132. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his, We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the word of the Lord. Almighty God, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule. May your spirit be our teacher. And may your greater glory be our supreme concern. We ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Easter brings us to the heart and core at the very foundation of our Christian faith. And I want us to consider through this passage this morning two particular levels at which that works. 
The first is the historical level of the events that we were looking at last Sunday on Easter Day itself, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised again, and that he appeared to his disciples. The historical events of what really happened through the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they are the foundation on which the whole of our Christian faith and practice is built. That's because the events of Easter provide the answer to the most important question that any human being can ask. And I would suggest to you that that is the question, how is it possible for a sinful person like me to become acceptable to the holy God who is my creator? How can I be in the right with my maker? And the answer to that is, of course, in the cross and in the empty tomb of Jesus. But we're looking today at Romans chapter 6 to understand better not just the historical reality, but the amazing potential of that in our own lives, in our experience. Martin Luther described the book of Romans as the clearest gospel of all. And these verses we've just read are certainly um, deserving that title. But the question that Paul's concerned with here in this passage is not so much the historical facts of Easter, that's the foundation level, but a second level, which is answering the question, what difference does that make in our everyday life? If that is the historical foundation, then how does it work out in practice? The great Reformation theologian John Calvin put it this way. He said, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. All that he possesses is nothing until we grow into one body with him. And this, he says, we obtain by faith. So how can those events of nearly 2,000 years ago now transform our daily lives in 2024. Now at the beginning of the passage, Paul is challenging his readers not to go on living a life enslaved by sin. And at the end, he makes the same appeal. If you just look at verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Verse 13, don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. But the question is how? How can this happen? And the answer to that question is the dynamic that he expounds in the center of our passage, verses three to 11. Now often in a Bible passage, there is a key verse that focuses the teaching and that acts as a sort of key to unlock the surrounding verses. And it seems to me that verse 11 performs that function. Here is the verse that summarizes what we're looking at this morning. Count yourself, says Paul, dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And we'll never be able to do that unless we grasp the realities of verses 3 to 10, the teaching that he gives us. So we're going to look at it this morning under two simple headings. First of all, in verses three to five, there's a great declaration of our Christian identity. And then in verses six to 10, there's a wonderful explanation of our Christian experience, how what we are can be worked out in practice in our lives. So let's look at those two things for our encouragement and stimulus for us to live for Christ day by day. Firstly, our declaration, the declaration of our Christian identity. Look with me, if you will, at verse 3. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So Paul is defining Christians here. Christians are all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus. Now, our mind immediately goes to water baptism because that's what we talk about mostly when we're using the word baptism. And uh, where that happens when someone is immersed in water and rises from the water, 
It's the symbolism of being dead and buried under the water, as it were, and rising to a new life. So in verse 4, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So baptism is a vivid instructional tool, but we have to remember that the water doesn't achieve this. It is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. That is the grace of God in bringing us to new birth, to life in Jesus Christ. So when someone is baptized in water, all the water can do really is to make them wet, either very wet or only a little wet according to the mode, but it is a sign of a much deeper spiritual reality. It isn't the water that does the changing of the person. That's the outward sign of the inward work which God is doing in rescuing us and in making us members of his family, of the very body of Christ. So when Paul says to the Corinthians in another letter that he wrote, we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, the body of Christ, that's what he's thinking of primarily here. And he's saying, a Christian is someone who has been baptized by that one spirit, look at verse 3, into Christ Jesus. Into Christ Jesus. That is, a baptism by the Holy Spirit which joins us to Christ. The inward work of God of which water baptism is the outward sign. Now the phrase that Paul <coughs> uses to describe Christian believers in his letters, <clears throat> he uses it over 150 times, it's the two little words, in Christ. That is what it means to be a Christian, to be in Christ. It's all the way through the passage, you see, verse 3, baptized into Christ Jesus. Verse 4, buried with him in baptism. Verse 5, united with him in his death and also in his resurrection. Crucified with him, verse 6. Verse 8, we died with Christ. Verse 9, uh, sorry, again in verse 8, we shall also live with him. And then our key verse, verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So union with Christ is the theme of this whole section that applies Easter to our lives. You see, it's wonderful to know, isn't it, that our sins have been forgiven. But that is only the start of our blessings in Christ. We've been joined to Christ. We've been united to Christ. We are alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that is why we're alive to God, because we are in Christ, who is alive forevermore. It is though we are a part of him. Jesus himself said, he's the vine, and we are the branches. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died there as our substitute, as he took the punishment that we deserve, but also as our representative, so that in his death, we died. That's what Paul is saying here. The power of sin was broken because his death was accepted by the Father as our death. That's the death that we deserve to die eternally because of our sinful nature and behavior. But Jesus died that death as our substitute, as our representative. So as far as God the Father is concerned, in Jesus we died. That old way of living was finished. It was buried with him. But if we are identified with Christ in his death and burial... What's the outcome? Well, verse 4 is very clear, isn't it? Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life, a resurrection life in the power of Jesus because we are in Christ. Literally, verse 4 ends saying, we might walk in newness of life. So here is the great declaration for every Christian, everyone who repents and believes the good news of the gospel that in Christ's death we died to sin and in Christ's resurrection 
we are risen to live a new life through the power and enabling of the risen Lord. And verse 5 sums up that certainty wonderfully, doesn't it? Let's just look at that verse. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, I think it's important to see <clears throat> that Paul is not saying we have to make this happen. This is the reality of God's work. This is what God has already done. It's all past tenses. This is God's work through the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's through the glory of the Father, as verse, seven, uh, verse 4 says. So at the cross, we see God's work for us in bearing the punishment of our sin, the death that we deserve, so that in Christ we are dead to sin. And then in the resurrection, we see God's work in us as he unites us with Jesus. And that verb, united, which is in verse 5, is a word that's used literally to mean grafted into or planted together with, growing together. It's like the idea of a, a, of a shoot being grafted into uh, a rootstock and the parent plant life flows through the new um, grafted shoot in, in, in making it a new plant. We're in Christ. He is our life. That life flows through into our experience not something I'm hoping for. It's not something I'm striving for. It's not something I ought to do. No, it's a declaration of reality. This is your identity as a Christian person. We died with him. We are buried with him. We have been raised with him to a new realm, a new life. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Well, there's the great declaration that Paul is making. And he's saying, remember who you are. But secondly, what about how that works out in our experience? And this is verses 6 to 10. In verses 6 and 7, he's expounding the first part of verse 5. We're united with him in his death. Verses 6 and 7 explain that. And then the second part of verse 5, we're united with him in his resurrection. Verses 8 to 10 explain that. So here is our Christian experience. Our old self, Paul says, by which he means our life before we were Christians, our life outside of Christ. He describes it in chapter 5 of Romans as being in Adam. He says, when we repent and believe the good news of Jesus as our Savior, that old way of living is nailed to Christ's cross and buried in Christ's tomb. And this has the result that the old way of living, which was dominated by my rebellion against God, my unwillingness to let him be God in my life, that has now been dealt with through the cross of Jesus. And it has been, well, the verse says, it's been rendered powerless. We know that our old self, verse 6, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, or you see the footnote says, rendered powerless. That's what the cross of Jesus achieves. Now, if that is true, then it means that the chains of slavery have been snapped. We have been set free from sin. Verse 7, anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Well, then if we died in Christ, as far as God is concerned, all the repercussions of that sin have been met by Jesus. And that doesn't mean, of course, that we never sin, because we're still tempted, and sometimes we succumb to those temptations, but that's because we choose to do it. The tyrant power of sin that governed us and gave us no freedom, that's no longer ruling over us. We have finished with its control over us. Let's try and illustrate that. Supposing someone comes to our country fleeing from persecution and oppression and they have an application for asylum and eventually they are granted citizenship. When you are granted citizenship, you can apply for a new passport. In a sense, it is the same person, but they have a new identity. They're no longer under the control of that oppressive regime that they fled from. They're now a free citizen in this country. 
And it may take them a long time to realize that. If you talk to people who've been in that position, often they're still suffering from nightmares about the past, looking over their shoulder to see if anyone's after them, fearful that revenge will be taken. But whatever they feel about it, the fact of the matter is that they have a new identity. The old has no control over them. And that is what our union with Christ in his death and in his resurrection has achieved. Look at verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. That old way of living is crucified and buried with Jesus when you turn to him and become a believer in him. So that the corruptions of the flesh no more reign in us. They're no more in control over us. That's the first part of the experience, united with him in a death like his. But what about the second? Verse 8 reminds us that we are united with him in his resurrection. For if we died with Christ, verse 8 says, we believe that we will also live with him. The resurrection proves that Jesus has dealt with sin and death once for all. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again, verse 9 says. Death has no longer any mastery over him. He's conquered all those hostile powers by his resurrection from the dead. You see, when Jesus came into our world as our savior, he humbled himself by putting himself into the realm of sin and death and the devil. In order to save us, he didn't sin. He defeated the devil at every point, And in the end, he conquered death itself. But he came into a temporary situation where he was under the control of those forces. At least he was living in that sort of environment. But having accomplished our salvation, by his death and his glorious resurrection, he's returned to the heavenly glory that he had with the Father before the world began. The life he lives, verse 10, he lives to God. And if that is true of our Lord Jesus, and you are in Christ, then it is true of all his people. Because we are in Christ, we're no longer in the realm of sin and death. He's taken us out of that realm into the realm of God's eternal life which has been planted in our souls and which energizes us to live a new life, the life of the risen Lord within us. Do you remember Charles Wesley's great words in one of those lovely hymns that we often sing, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? One verse says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. There you are, there's the bondage, the slavery. Your eye, thine eye, diffused a quickening ray. God shone his light into our lives. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. See, that's the experience that he's talking about. How can Easter with its declaration of new life in Christ, impact our daily experience. Well, there's one more ingredient before we finish. Let's go back to our key verse. In the same way, verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here is the connection. This is what faith does. Count yourselves. It's an interesting word. Some translations have reckon yourselves. Another one says consider yourselves gives us our English word from the original uh, Greek word that gives us the word logic. See, what he's saying is counting yourself is an activity of the mind. You start with the facts that are established and accepted. Christ died, was buried, and rose again for us. Then you draw the conclusion from the facts, and you apply it by acting on it. That's what faith does. Counting on what God has said and done. Probably most of us have some cash somewhere on our person this morning, and if you take out a banknote, you see those familiar words, which we don't often read, but they're on every, every banknote. I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds, 10, 20, whatever it is. 
and there is the signature of the chief cashier of the Bank of England, which is the guarantee that the promise will be fulfilled. And we don't think about it, we just use it, obviously, as money in the ordinary way every day. But the Bank of England, because of its vast resources, can make that promise a reality. And so it is, you see, in the Christian life. We live on the promise of God, whose forces, whose resources are, are eternal and are immeasurable. And the promise of God established in Scripture is that as we count ourselves dead to sin, we will be alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's a wonderful thing to know that, isn't it? It's not wishful thinking. You can count on it because it's true. This is what God says about our identity. And our identity is worked out in our experience. We're no longer under the rule of sin. And though we shall one day die, unless the Lord returns first, death has no rights over us. It is but the gate to life immortal. We are alive to God in Christ Jesus, and we always will be. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, not even death. So count on it. And here and now, we receive new life from him because there's this vital union with Jesus, which means that the risen, all-powerful Lord is sharing his life with us. We're in Christ, and he's in us by his Spirit so that we can experience the life of God in our human souls. And all our spiritual life and power come to us through our union with the risen Lord Jesus. And what he'll do is go on transforming us into his likeness as we draw on his power day by day. So how does it work? Well, when we're facing temptations, we say, Lord, I can't overcome this in my strength. I'm looking to you for your strength. Lord, give me the strength now to resist this temptation. And he does, because you're alive in Christ. I need courage in this situation, Lord. I'm not brave enough to cope with it. But you can give me your strength. And he does, as you put your faith in him and derive it from him. When you're perplexed and confused, he will guide your pathway if you ask him. When you're fearful of the future, he will give you the assurance of that eternal home in heaven and of the fact that he'll be with us every step of the way till we get there. When you're discouraged and downcast, he can lift you up if you lift your eyes to him and trust him. Lord, live your life through me. That's the daily Christian prayer. I count myself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So I'm not going to let sin reign in my mortal body. I'm not going to offer any part of myself as an instrument of wickedness. But here I am, Lord, each morning, every day, offering myself to God, verse 13, as one who has been brought from death to life. And I want to offer every part of myself to you as an instrument of righteousness. This is not about feelings. It is about the fact of who we are in Christ and how we can experience this gospel miracle in our lives day by day. One last illustration. If we were to go this afternoon to <coughs> Gatwick Airport and watch people as they are uh, getting on planes to go all over the world, one of the things that strikes you as you look carefully is that people go with varying degrees of confidence to get on a plane. There are some people who do it every week of their lives. It's just part of what they're used to. They don't think about it. But there are others, perhaps, for whom it's a very rare occurrence. And they're a little bit nervous. And it's almost uh, one step forward and two steps back. But all of them, whatever they are feeling, whether they're confident or not, if they, by faith, commit themselves to that plane, what they are doing is trusting the plane's ability to get them to their destination. It's a greater power to which they commit themselves. Because humanly speaking, the law of gravity says you can't fly, you're bound to the earth. But the law of aerodynamics, or whatever they are, the, very, uh, the principles that have been discovered, mean that all the time you're in the plane, you benefit from that superior power of those jet engines that takes off and transforms your context 
uh, overcoming the down drag of, gra of gravity and brings you from Gatwick to wherever your destination is. And when you arrive and people say, oh, how did you get here? You say, I flew. Well, no, you didn't. But you were in the plane. The plane flew. That was where the power was. And you trusted it. And it brought you to your destination. And it's rather like that with our Christian experience. We are in Christ. We draw upon his limitless resources. Count yourselves. Yes, God says it. I'm going to trust him. So I'm counting on it. That he will be my strength. He will be my life. And the reality of Easter will transform our everyday experience. And if we live like that, it will be noticed. The world will begin to see that Christianity is not just a load of religious ideas. Christianity is a dynamic experience of the living God and his resurrection life, even in us, his people. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you, our risen King, our Lord and Saviour. We praise you not only that you went through death and triumphed over it in the glorious resurrection by the Father's power, but we thank you that you care for your people and all that you are in yourself you make available to us because we are in Christ and you are in us the hope of the glory that is yet to come. So we pray that this week, Lord, you'll help us to draw on those heavenly resources. Thank you that there is no limit of your power. Thank you that you're able to transform our situations as we trust in you. So, Lord, save us from simply being earthbound in our um, perspectives and in our desires. Please help us to know that just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we too may live a new life because we are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And to your name be the glory and the praise for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, let's stand and respond to God's love in all that he's done for us and gives us as we sing a hymn that contains the full gospel message. There's some duplication on your service sheet, so do follow the words on the screen. Let's offer up our praises as we sing one day. Let's stand and sing.
wonderful words, full of truth and certain hope. As we stand, let's declare and affirm our faith in God. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please would you like to sit as Carol comes to lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the new life we have been given in Jesus. May we share it with others. Lord God, we come to pray for our world. We lift to, those, we lift to you those people in Taiwan who have been shocked and devastated by the recent earthquake. Please help the rescuers to find those buried under the bricks and rubble. Comfort those who are bereaved. Bring healing to the injured. Help with the rebuilding of areas badly damaged and use the Christians there to share your love. Amen. Our mission this week to pray for is the Mother's Union. Dear Lord, we pray for the campaign going on against domestic violence. Please be with those in refuges in Eastbourne. Be with Catherine as she visits Canterbury and later Barcelona. We pray that you'll guide all those in the Mother's Union who work on behalf of those suffering in our world. Amen. In our family here, please bless the Life of Jesus course which is starting soon. May those who don't yet know you come along. We ask that preparations for the APCM will go smoothly and that you will call those that you want to serve in our church. We pray that you'll strengthen our staff team. We think of all those who are ill or bereaved amongst us and in silence we remember them now. And the collect for this Sunday, the first Sunday after Easter. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now we finish with the Lord's Prayer, which is on your service sheet or on the screen. Let's join together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever.
Thank you, Carol. Well, let's stand and sing our final song. And as we sing, let's open our hearts in total thankfulness to Jesus and sing hallelujah. We sing what is our hope in life and death. Let's stand and sing. we go into this new week whatever the storms whatever the trials doubts or fears we are safe in his resurrection life so let's offer ourselves our time our talents and all that we have as we say our offertory prayer we bring you only what is yours creator god that you might use this offering and the giver for the building up of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. 
Please jo do join us in the hall for refreshments after the service. And if you would like prayer for you or a loved one or a situation that's heavy on your heart, then members of the prayer ministry team will be in the side chapel on my right, ready to pray with you. Let's close our service with a blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Do join us again next Sunday and have a great week. <laughs>